I am your host, Nicole Will, and we're so happy you're here as we navigate the world with your aging loved one. We are here to come alongside older adults, family members, and the senior living community as we explore the world of aging and elder care with helpful resources, informative interviews, and approachable conversations. We get to do this together, so join us on our journey, and this is the Will Gather Podcast. We have seen a massive rise in age tech with the current trends of aging adults, the lack of caregiver support, and the option of only relying on humans is not sustainable. Karen Etkin is my guest today. She is a gerontologist and the best-selling author of The Age Tech Revolution, a book about the intersection of technology and aging. She is also the founder of The Geron Technologist, a media platform that covers the global age tech ecosystem and offers online courses through the Age Tech Academy. Today, we talk about our shared connection with our grandparents, what is happening in our world right now, the demographic shift that is occurring, what is age tech, what are the major challenges of aging that we really need tech to address, what to consider when designing technology for older adults, what we should look for in age tech that we want to implement in our lives, and what do successful tech companies get right and why we can be hopeful for the future of age tech. I encourage everyone to purchase and read this book. I have marked up my own personal copy. This book and conversation sets the stage for us as we dive into the future landscape of aging and tech. We are in a unique time to be able to solve and look at what is coming down the line and understanding how to use that technology for good. Here is my conversation with Karen Etkin. Hi, Karen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I've been counting down the days to be able to meet you and visit with you. So this has been just so fun for me. Uh, You cannot, or my listeners cannot see, I have literally, I have this whole book marked and all of my notes and I think it'll be one I'm going to keep for years and look at and reference. It almost felt like a mini Jero course too, where it gave <laughs> such a perfect uh, description of the landscape of where we've been, where we're going, and you've really set the stage for us to then dive into what the future of aging and tech is going to look like. So thank you for all of your hard work on that. I know it just takes so much, so much time and effort to put that together. Thank you. Thank you. It it does take a lot of time and effort, but uh, I'm very fortunate to have had a a lot of support from the, from the, from the age tech community and also from a specific group of people who have actually helped me fund the production of the book. Mm -hmm. So I always like had that to hold on to during the the tough times. Yeah. And as we need that community to like keep encouraging us when it gets hard, there was something that you had said when you had spoke before, I think it was for your book launch and you talked about just the how the idea found you and where we like ask ourselves those questions like can I do this is this something worth reading and that you wrote something that you really wanted to extend that you would enjoy and that you would want to have be out there in the world so I'm glad that you persevered through that and it came together thank you thank you so much and yes I think this I've been writing about age tech for a few years now for the German technologist and the pandemic felt like it was a good time to actually write a book, not just because I finally had the time to sit down to write it, but also because I felt like we had sort of the age tech ecosystem is no longer like very new, mm-hmm. uh, immature ecosystem that it used to be a few years ago. Now there is a lot of momentum and behind it there are so many wonderful startups developing amazing solutions and it felt like the right time to really create just one piece of content that would be a great uh, like you said intro to what this is why it's important and why I think everyone should get involved reading through it it made me think about it does 
affect each part of our life, but also the aging journey and all the things that to consider where we've been, how it's going to impact our future, our loved ones, people that we love. We have a shared uh, connection in that we both really came to where we are because of this connection we had with our grandparents. And I would love for you to share not only maybe a little bit about that, but your background and how you got to the place where you are now. So yeah, we definitely share that, which is which is great. Uh, and I think this is something that a lot of people who end up working in the aging space share, uh, this really very strong connection with either our grandparents or other older loved ones. Um, and I almost, like, I'm, I'm a gerontologist, and I almost sort of became a gerontologist by accident because I was actually, uh, when I went to university, I really wanted to become a scientist, and, and I did get a life sciences degree. And my dream growing up was to, like, be, be a researcher, wear a lab coat, work with, bacteria or cells uh, and I did get to do some of that uh, but I also found out um, very much by chance um, that I also enjoyed working with older adults and and doing um, work in the community so I got to to be a volunteer at this student organization um, that was doing work with holocaust survivors which back then they were all over the age of 65 already Um, and I thought wow this is really this is really interesting and impactful and I really enjoy like having conversations Mm -hmm. with with older people like that was the highlight of my day during some days Um, so I, I really was drawn into this world and I decided to not pursue a career in science but actually go work uh, in the nonprofit sector in community services for older adults. And after a few years, I got recruited to Intuition Robotics. So that was sort of my pivot into, into the world of, of tech and age tech. And, and the rest is history, yeah. as, as you say. And then you started the Geron Technologist a few years prior. Is that correct? And that. So the Geron Technologist was actually born. About a year after I joined Intuition Robotics, okay. um, because I I remember um, my my colleague Daphna and I went to this Aging 2.0 event in Tel Aviv, and I just rem- remember sitting in a room full of other age tech entrepreneurs, and I was like, "Wow, we're actually like, we are part of an ecosystem. There are more of us out there developing technology for older adults." I realized that. I wanted to learn more about what other people were doing. And once I did quite a lot of research about it, I, I reviewed hundreds, if not thousands of startups from around the world. I decided to just put it online. And this is how the, the first version of the annual HDIC market map came about. And that was how the German technologist was born. And I just kept on, because it, it gained uh, so much traction, I just mm-hmm. kept on writing and I kept on doing it and uh, yeah it's been a very very rewarding experience not just having an online platform where I get to share my thoughts Mm -hmm. but also the fact that the sort of the side effect of of it is that I get to have a lot of really interesting conversations with interesting people from all over the world like yourself yeah so like that's something that I I never expected and it's wonderful it really like expands my world Mm -hmm. infinitely it does there's such a richness it's and like I can't believe I get to do this for a job to be able to meet with people that can share so much knowledge and have us shifting how we think and highlighting needs and providing those solutions there's nothing like it absolutely absolutely there is there is really nothing like having one-on-one conversations with people who do things that are dramatically different Mm -hmm. than what you're doing their day-to-day looks completely different and I think you know one of the positive aspects of of a global pandemic is that we got we actually get to meet more people from parts of the world that we never would have been able to visit Mm -hmm. right I can have conversations in one day with people from from uh two or three different continents. Mm -hmm. That's insane. 
in some ways are so much more connected. Yeah. And I got a lot of, a lot of interviews for the book. Actually, all of the interviews that I did for the book were done via Zoom because mm-hmm. we were still in lockdown. Mm-hmm. And even in doing interviews with older adults, uh, it was very natural to do it over Zoom. Like I just, I just would, would send them a calendar invite with the Zoom link and then we would, we would talk on Zoom. How, how wonderful yeah. is that? That would never have been possible in 2019, mm-hmm. right? So true. It's changed how we do things in, in a good way. It's highlighted where we knew that we could do things a different way. And now, now we are, and it's widely adopted. I think I remember when I was working in nursing home it was one of my first jobs and I was taking uh, nursing classes at the time and working with those older adults it was that similar experience where I just loved my time with them and they taught me so much and I would ask those questions of uh, what they used to do and a lot of them were war veterans and hearing their story and I just ended up shifting that like track of my life to go study gerontology also based on just time spent with older adults. And I just think the message is like, we can't ever take for granted what we can learn and encourage that younger generation to be open and, and see what's ahead of them. And it could change. Absolutely. And you know what, they, they, we, we feel like there are coincidences in life that sort of shift the the trajectory of our entire lives or or our entire career but at the end of the day that there is a there is a saying um we're busy making plans Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day like just life happened Mm -hmm. right and Mm -hmm. i think this is i'm very very fortunate to to have had things happen in my career the way they they had like i i didn't even know that gerontology was a profession Mm -hmm. a year before I signed up Mm -hmm. (laughs) to get a gerontology degree either I was like wait this is like a thing I could actually I know yeah yeah and and I was like I was thrilled to to find out about it Mm -hmm. and it was like a no-brainer to Mm -hmm. sign up for school it was the easiest decision Mm -hmm. I ever made so there's a lot happening in our world right now there's this demographic shift that's occurring why are we in this pivotal time what's happening kind of what's the landscape this is a great question we're at at this pivotal moment in time because we are currently experiencing the sort of the intersection of two major trends in our society one is the the demographic shift that's unprecedented we've never had so many people reach very old ages we've never had so many people in our population who are over the age of 60, 70, 80. And we are also going through this very radical digital transformation, right? Everything in our lives, especially over the past two years, has gone digital, has gone online. And this is obviously, it's never happened before. Mm -hmm. So this is an opportunity on one hand. um, And it's also a a major challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Because this this generation or these several generations of people who are over the age of of 60, 70 or 80 are not digital natives, right? They didn't grow up using computers, smartphones, smart speakers, and they, they have to learn it. And unfortunately, most of the consumer facing technology today is designed by younger adults for younger adults. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily People aren't necessarily thinking, not not because not because they have bad intentions, just because it never crosses people's minds that we need to make sure that consumer-facing technology uh, is not only usable by older adults or anyone who's not a digital native, uh, but it also actually brings value to their lives and it solves a real need. Uh, and this is sort of the, the opportunity and the reason why we even have an age tech ecosystem, right? Because we have hundreds of tech companies who are doing this exact same thing, dedicating their time and all of their effort and all of their resources to not only tackling the challenges of aging with technology, uh, but also making sure that what they're building is brings value to 
to people's lives and that it's actually uh, usable for older adults. Um, and I think this is a, a massive opportunity and I, I can't wait to see where this ecosystem ends up and what new solutions people develop. I agree. I feel like every day I see a new company that's emerged and it's fun to see what they're addressing and what they're tackling. And now more than ever before, uh, it seems to be there's that rapid growth. How does the U.S. compare with the rest of the world? Is every country in a similar situation in terms of the demographics and the rise in tech? So Western countries, generally speaking, are more or less in the same experiencing the same trends Mm -hmm. not everyone has almost almost 30 percent of the population over the age of 60 like japan does Mm -hmm. Uh, but we're like the entire world is headed in a direction where we're when we'll have 20 percent of the population over the age of 60 by 2050 Mm -hmm. that's less than three decades from now Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're all headed there obviously um technology is um, advancing at an increasingly growing pace. Um, so we have to include older adults in this in this transformation that our society is going through. And we also have to use technology to tackle some of the challenges of aging because traditional solutions, uh, as, as you know very well, are unfortunately not very scalable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have to use technology to to do a lot of the things that humans are currently doing yeah. um, and let humans do the things that are uniquely human mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. And, and let technology handle yeah. all the manual labor in the yeah. for sure. I love how you highlight that where you talk about that there is no replacement for that human care and that human touch, but because of the trends, because of the lack of caregiver support, that we can't rely on humans for certain tasks because it's just not sustainable. We're just not going to be able to do that. Yeah. And what we see, unfortunately, what we see happening oftentimes is if if we take um, the home care um, industry, for example, uh, the, the entire long-term care for older adults is experiencing a huge, a massive caregiver shortage. Mm-hmm. That is a, a global challenge. Everyone is experiencing it and it's not going away. It's only going to get worse. Mm-hmm. So what happens um, in home care, for example, we have almost everyone wants to age in place, right? So many people will require home care at some point. And if it's not available or if it's not affordable, then people end up not receiving the care that they need. Right, uh, and that is the that, that is the definitely not the desired outcome, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So why not why not develop technology to tackle some of those challenges, right? We already have vacuum robots and mop robots. Mm-hmm. Why not have robots prepare meals, mm-hmm. do the dishes, arrange the pantry? We don't we don't really need humans yeah. to do all of that, and then we can have the human caregiver come to the person's home, check in on them, have a conversation with them, just really take care of their like emotional well-being, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Because nowadays, unfortunately, because caregivers are so overburdened, both family caregivers and paid caregivers, they don't necessarily have the time to do that. They're so worried about taking care of the tasks that have to happen, that it doesn't leave room or as much energy to then pour into that emotional, relational connection. Absolutely. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons, or or probably the main reason, many people go to become caregivers anyway, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They want to be that person. They want to provide that that emotional support and and comfort and companionship. But then they are faced with with a task list Mm -hmm. that has to be accomplished in a very specific number of hours. So everything else gets pushed to the side. So the term age tech, I feel like it's a more, uh, it's a newer term that we're hearing more frequently. How would you describe it? What is age tech? So I like to describe age tech as a technology that is designed with and for older adults to tackle the challenges of aging. Um, and the reason why I like to emphasize the 
with and for mm -hmm. is because I think it's critical to include older adults in the design process of technology that uh, they're either supposed to, to use or that affects them in, in any way, shape or form. Um, I think that's unfortunately hasn't always been done mm -hmm. by companies because mm -hmm. it is a challenge to do and it does require resources. But I think it's the only it's the only way to go and 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 companies are getting better and better at it. And there are also many more resources to achieve this. You've got uh, groups like the, the Longevity Explorers, which will happily do guided exploration sessions for your startup. And you've also got um, multiple uh, long term care providers who have sort of innovation programs and are willing mm -hmm. to pilot all sorts of technology. Uh, not just with older adults, but also with other stakeholders like nurses, doctors, um, direct care workers, everyone involved. Um, so it's, I, I'm aware of the fact that it's, that it's challenging. I've done it myself. I know how hard it is, but I think there is no way around it. Yeah, so true. And to have it done well, which is the goal, to yeah. have that inclusion. And you had also spoke to that it's not preventing aging, that there's that clear distinction that it's, <laughs> yes. it's not so anti-aging. <laughs> so a, a, a common misconception, I mean, sometimes when I, when I uh, have conversations with people who, who really have never heard of age tech before, they think, oh, you, you're developing anti-aging products or that is the, the assumption mm -hmm. and then I have to explain no 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 we're not we're not doing that uh, we're tackling the challenges of aging for people who are either already yeah. in their later years or about to become older adults which we all will we'll all be old eventually for lucky right yeah we're all aging every day there was someone that had said uh, if we're not aging what's the alternative we're not here we're 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 not alive anymore. Yeah. And so it just, that's like shifted my perspective. I'm like, yes, I want to continue yes. to age every day <laughs> and continue. Yeah, to absolutely. Age. Yeah. There are a lot of challenges that come along with this uh, time of life as we continue to grow older and tech addresses those challenges. Can you specifically lay out like, what are some of those big challenges that need to be addressed absolutely so so the most obvious challenges are around the health and wellness mm -hmm. um areas um because unfortunately as as we grow old uh we have the physical process of aging which creates a new set of challenges around it and also we have a very new set of challenges around retirement right because in the past people would retire uh, at around the age of 65. And then they didn't live too long after that, right? Because life expectancy was a lot lower than it is today. Whereas now people who retire in their 60s can expect to live 20 or 30 more years. What do you do with all this time? How do you support yourself financially? Mm -hmm. Where do you want to live? Like, is your home going to be the right environment for you? 10, 20, 30 years from now. So there is a lot of a lot of work to be done around that. And I'm super excited to to see what mm -hmm. what people will do to address these challenges. And there are also like the challenges that aren't really new, but technology is sort of tackling in new and very interesting ways, like like leaving a legacy. Mm -hmm. Right? In the past you would write your memoir. And some people would print it and give it to their grandchildren. And every every person in the family would have this book that grandma wrote. Now people can record themselves either with audio or video and leave something better mm -hmm. behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've actually seen a company that lets you sort of um, ask a question to, to the database that your older loved one recorded. And then you can see them uh, respond. Like it will pull out the recording of them talking about that particular point oh. in their life, and you, you get to to see it, yeah. uh, which is a far more engaging experience it than is. reading a book. Mm -hmm. And I and, and I say that 
even though I'm an author, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm more interactive. That's the way maybe. it is. is that the way? Yeah, more interactive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are mo- so many more challenges that just we've never experienced mm-hmm. before. And there are new challenges coming up every day. And, and I'm very, very optimistic mm-hmm. that we'll get to, to solve many of them with technology. Yeah. And what's the challenge with connecting older adults with technology? Obviously, the people who are currently over the age of 60, 70, or 80 aren't aren't digital natives, right? They weren't born with a touch screen and a keyboard and a mouse, and definitely not with a smart speaker Mm -hmm. uh, in their homes. So they didn't grow up with it. Um, So there is one challenge of providing the, the digital literacy to millions and millions of people Mm -hmm. and also there is the challenge of like like any any technology of allowing people to discover the right solutions for them allowing them to to uh, sort of onboard themselves or or providing uh, a better adoption experience for people Um, and also there was recently a, a research published it was early 2021 that we still have a major digital divide, even in the United States, mm. uh, where they they found that 22 million older Americans don't have uh, broadband internet in their homes, wow. and I found that simply mind blowing. Yeah, uh, and and the the reasons behind that is that people either just don't have access mm-hmm. to broadband internet where they live, which is insane or they can't afford it, mm-hmm. um, which is, I guess it's a, it's an easier problem to solve because you can just solve it with money. Yeah. Um, but still, just having, having this digital divide, not just in, in digital literacy, but also in accessibility to the internet and to devices mm-hmm. in 2022, it's just, it's not acceptable. We have to solve it as soon as possible. I read those numbers and same, I just could not believe it because we take for granted that a lot of us do have access to it, but we forget uh, or we don't know what we can't see or or have awareness of. And yeah, it's just an unbelievable. When families and older adults, if they're looking for age tech and obviously it will need to be individualized for what their needs are, meeting those solutions to the problems that they're having, is there like a best practice of what they should look for? And and I'm using quotes like good tech, good age tech, some kind of key things to be mindful of. This is actually a great question. So I don't know if I would sort of classify it. I would not, I probably wouldn't necessarily classify it as good or bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I think finding the right fit is really important. So if we look at specific challenges of aging let's take for example the challenge of falls right one or one out of four people over the age of 65 will fall each year and that's incredibly dangerous mm. it leads to uh, mortality mm-hmm. uh, or 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 disability right it's no one wants to, to have that so you can tackle that in in many different ways right you have obviously the traditional purse right the Mm -hmm. personal emergency response systems that you either have to press a button or you wear a pendant and you and you press the button and it 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 goes to the uh, emergency call center and you get help that is one option now we also have wearables right even the apple watch is able to detect falls we have sensors that we can install in the home right sensors that are based on on radio frequency volume sensors, um, uh, cameras, there is really no shortage of solutions for the challenge, the very specific challenge of fall detection. And now if you're a family member or if you're an older adult looking for a solution, you need to then figure out which of these dozens of challenges, uh, solutions is right for you. Um, And then like if I were to think of the best practices, let's say I was going to to install such a system for my grandparents. Um, first of all, I would have a discussion with them and lay out all the different options for sensors and see what they're comfortable with, right? Do you want sensors to be installed in every room of your home or do you prefer to wear an Apple Watch? If you prefer an Apple Watch 
um, are you comfortable with charging it once or twice a week? Mm -hmm. That's a commitment, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> if yeah. not, maybe we should just get a sensor that's plugged into uh, the electricity constantly. Do you need it to, to be connected to an emergency call center or are you comfortable with us getting the notifications and we'll come over and give you the help you need? So I think it's very, um, on the individual level, but the good thing is that we ha we have options, mm -hmm. right? Which we didn't have ten years ago. Um, so I hope that answers yeah. people's, no, that people's is, uh, <laughs> listening. I hope they they get my answer and yeah. that that it that it's helpful and not too confusing. Right? No, it was helpful, and I loved how you brought it back to asking the older adult what their preferences are and what they're comfortable with because I think that that needs to be taken into consideration. And I think too, I, a part of my thought process around it was, are some age tech companies better about building an ecosystem of support outside of maybe the device, customer service, or I don't know, I was just trying to think of that whole, if you're working with a company or you're you know implementing them, I think my first thought is, is it going to provide me a, you know, obviously meet the, solve the problem and work well with, for our family, but also what if I need to call and I have questions or I don't know if that, does that make sense? Yeah, abso it absolutely makes sense. Uh, and that is also another thing that I would, I would uh, check out. Um, so if you are expecting that this particular product or service that you're getting will require uh, support, then yeah, we definitely like make sure that they have phone support because a lot of tech companies these days don't have phone support at all. And they only have email support, chat support, which is, it, it can be uh, annoying to some people mm -hmm. and it might not be the most convenient way for uh, all the adults to reach out mm -hmm. to support. Um, and also I would check out if they have like good, um, good manuals even if they're online if they have like good manuals good tutorials that people can watch to sort of educate themselves about mm -hmm. the product and how to use it so i would definitely consider all of these yeah uh, i know it's a lot of work yeah it's a lot of research to do it's a lot of digging to find the right solution for you yeah. um but i think um i think companies these days generally speaking are are better at at um, providing these types of online tutorials, mm -hmm. including in, in video format. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I haven't yet met an H tech company that doesn't provide phone support. I mean, if it's a, if it's a direct to consumer company, I, I'm pretty sure all of them do. Yeah. Yeah. That's good to hear. Uh, and while we're talking about the company side, what do successful tech companies get right? What would you attribute to their success? This is a great question. First of all, obviously, they have to get the product right, right? The product experience, it has to be not only usable and not only does it have to bring value to people's lives, but it also has to make them feel good about themselves uh, rather than make them feel old and frail. That's a big no-no. Uh, and if it can be delightful, that's like a huge bonus, right? If you can put a smile on someone's face whenever they use your product, they're going to continue using your product. It's that simple. Uh, it's not easy, but I think it, obviously it's a rewarding way to go. And also providing, providing support and providing, not only providing support over the phone, but also educating your customer support representatives uh, on how to provide tech support for an older individual who is not a digital native and they might not know what an icon means. So you have to invest in that as well. And, and again, I'm pretty sure consumer facing extra companies are, are already doing it. I definitely know that the successful ones are doing it. Which is why they're successful. <laughs> you know? Probably. Yeah. And you talked about including that older adult in that design process and you talked about like validating the problem and validating the solution. So it's not just, I think, us 
thinking that this could be helpful, but it's validating that. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Yes. A lot of times when I would meet HTEC founders, many of them have started their companies because of a very personal reason, right? They either were a family caregiver or they, they encountered something, some challenge that their older loved one was facing and they couldn't find the solution for it. So they started, decided to start a company. I think that is, that is great. That is an amazing, amazing motivation to start doing something because startups are hard. And if you're, you don't have the right motivation, uh, it's going to be very hard for you to push through the hard times. Um, however, the successful ones actually validate that it's not just their grandmother that has this problem, mm. but millions of other people. So you can really ask millions of people, but you can ask 50, 100, 200 people mm -hmm. and really make sure that this problem that you, you believe that you've identified that doesn't yet have a solution actually exists. Uh, for a large enough number of people that you can build a company around it. Uh, and only then should you go out and create a solution. Sometimes people have, sometimes people do it the other way around, right? They have this idea mm -hmm. and they, they skip the, the first and very important step of really defining that problem that you're solving and making sure that it actually exists mm -hmm. and that you, that it, it, you haven't made it up or it, it's not just your grandma. Yeah, most of the age tech CEOs that I've interviewed, it has been that personal connection or story where they saw this need and then they wanted to address it, which it, it is such a great mission to have, but you also have to have the real life application and implementation to see, is this going to be viable long-term and be successful? Absolutely. Uh, and if you're only going to ask your grandmother, you're going to hear what she, but yeah. you you're gonna hear what you want to hear because yeah. she she's not gonna want to let you down yes. she's she's never your grandmother is never going to tell you yes. that you shouldn't do what you're doing because she thinks you're awesome i know grandmas are the best and you probably are you probably are awesome yeah but you still have to validate yeah exactly uh, for those that are hesitant to adopt the technology I think that sometimes there can be fear around change and doing something different. How can you put their mind at ease or what would you say to encourage them to try something new? So I think it's a very, it's a, I think it's a very human thing to be worrisome of change. Uh, and also a lot of people, especially uh, older people have had bad experiences with technology in the past because they've, used devices that were designed by younger adults for younger adults and like they didn't include older adults in the design process so they came up with something that only young people can use um having said that i think the the right way to go about it is to really dig deep into what your motivations are and what you what your goals are right because everyone has goals in whatever uh, stage of life they're at right you you have you might have different goals in your 20s and your 30s you might be your goals might to be to get an education get a career get married have children and in your 80s your goals might be different because you've already done all that mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> I think the the main thing to do and it's also what I what I say to to young founders um, really find out what the motivations are for your mm -hmm for your uh, users, for your customers. And then if you have a technology, a piece of technology at your disposal that will help you achieve your goals, mm. um, then I, I think it's worth it. It's worth a shot trying it. Um, and, it's, and it's okay to, to ask for help. Um, many people ask for help in adopting new technology and many companies provide the installation services and phone support um, and also in the United States I know it's very um, like many companies also offer like a 30-day money back guarantee mm -hmm. so try it out try it try it if you don't like it you can return it mm -hmm. like 
what's the worst that could happen? You've, you've spent a few hours testing out something you didn't like. It's not the worst thing that could happen. I still need help with certain tech. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I, I have questions all the time that I have to it figure happens, out. <laughs> it happens to everyone, yeah. right? Yeah, it does. I was talking to one of my older friends. She's 75 and this morning, actually, and she was saying that she encourages her friends to adapt and change and she's taking classes for herself and and in some ways she said it, it kind of gave her more purpose in life to have something to uh learn like learn something new and sign up for the class and then have the class on her schedule and so I think too if we can shift our mindset around it on uh, rather than feeling that it is uh, like a have to, but more of, oh, how fun this is in my schedule and I get to learn it. I don't know. <laughs> we'll yeah. try all the things. Yeah, it's a, it's a great way to think about it. I'm going to learn something new today. Isn't that exciting? And I'm going to I'm gonna succeed in it. Mm-hmm. Like, why not? You talk about the future and it's going to be really fun to see what happens. I'm going to ask you a long question and you can uh, take it in in strides, but there are benefits when we invest in age tech. So that's exciting uh, to see what happens in the future and also uh, different areas that we will, we need to address or will be going to address. And my last thought to that question is, uh, what are you hopeful for in the future? Uh, what do you think the landscape looks like in, in the next, I don't know, five, 10 years? So five, 10 years from now, this is like really the, the foreseeable future, right? Mm. Uh, I, I abso- I'm absolutely positive that we'll get to ride in autonomous cars, which is brilliant to think it's going to be not only something that hopefully will reduce the number of people who who get killed or injured in car crashes. But I think it's also going to be a great enabler for aging in place. Yeah. Um, because unfortunately for many people, um, when they reach a point where they either don't want to or can't drive themselves, they lose a huge part of, of their independence, right? You can't you can't get from point A to point B in your community because you, you just can't drive. Mm-hmm. You're dependent on other people um so having autonomous vehicles i think will be amazing i i really can't wait for that um and if we're looking further down the line i i definitely think we'll see more robotics and automation enter our homes and which is like i said it's not to replace humans but actually to uh sort of delegate the manual labor to to machines Mm -hmm. and let humans do the things that are uniquely human. Um, And, you know, when you think about it, even the, the, the very basic activity of daily living of cooking for yourself, preparing your own meals three times out of the day, uh, it can be physically challenging for people. And I've, I've spoken to people who have um, fed themselves with, nothing but sandwiches for years because they couldn't cook for themselves and they couldn't afford to to pay for someone to cook for them. So how amazing will it be when we can have an affordable version of a robotic chef as a household item, like a dishwasher, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So everyone can have nutritious nutritious meals prepared for them every day, three times a day or more. How, how how often, however often you'd like them to be prepared. So I'm very, very excited about that. Um, and we'll, we'll wait and see what happens and, and when it happens. Yeah. I That was one of my favorite parts of your book, and everyone will have to read it, is you, I enjoyed your glimpse into the future of what aging will look like and the role that it will play, how you wrote it. I could like set myself in that situation, and, and actually it came to life for me for the first time when I don't think uh, I had had that uh, perspective before. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was actually a fairly late addition to the manuscript. Uh, I, I didn't... Um, think about writing a fictional chapter at first Mm -hmm. Um, but then I had this idea and I talked I talked it over with my editor and she she green lighted it and very happy about of of how it turned out I am so glad that it got that it was added in 
Thank you so much for your, our conversation today. In fact, I've been sharing your book with everyone that I get a chance to talk to. And I had a meeting with a tech company um, earlier this week, and she got your book and read it and, and emailed me yesterday and said that she sent it to their whole uh leadership team and they all have to read the book and want to read the book so uh she's just it was so thankful you know not having the awareness that it was there but felt it was like vital for everyone on her leadership team to read so wow just another um yeah that's amazing thank you so much you're so welcome you're so welcome and thank you for your time i so appreciate it it's just been really, really great to finally meet you and connect with you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Nicole. It's been an absolute pleasure meeting you and and talking to you. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed our episode, please subscribe and give us five stars. (laughs) In all honesty, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening to our episode.